Well, good day, students. This is going to be a brief little lecture over Thomas Hobbes, his early life, his great works, and his ideas. As you uh, listen to the read aloud, you notice that he had some very stark ideas with regards to government and how people should be ruled over and how much freedom they should have. Uh, a very interesting individual during the time of the Enlightenment. Many of his ideas that he had were a result of the time that he found himself in with regards to uh, political upheaval and social unrest in England. And uh, he, at even at the times, found this to threaten his own life as well, too. So this will be a brief overview of Thomas Hobbes, his early life, and then his later life and his uh, importance of the Enlightenment and why he's still important even today. So remember that he lived to be the, uh, the age of 91, which was double the life expectancy. You, would, you only were expected to live into your 40s to mid 40s, 50 if you're lucky, um, during this period of history. But he surpassed that and lived uh, twice that uh, age expectancy from 1588 to 1679. He was born in London and was educated at Oxford University. And uh, while he was there, he studied the classics. Uh, he uh, pursued after uh, a classical education, if you will. Now, he is also very important when it comes to philosophy. He's considered to be what's called a political philosopher. So we talked about how Rene Descartes is the father of modern philosophy. Uh, consider Thomas Hobbes to be the father of political philosophy. Political philosophy is when we're dealing with uh, the ideas of what kind of government should be over the people and how much power should it have and then what kind of freedom should the people have itself. Thomas Hobbes is really going to begin that discussion of what kind of government should there be, what is the state of nature of man, why must he have this certain form of government over him. So he's very important with this. Another political philosopher that you'll study is John Locke and you're going to see they're going to have very different ideas about government and the state of nature of man to a certain extent. Now, he was a traveler. Thomas Hobbes uh, traveled Europe. Um, for instance, he would also have to flee from England and stay in Paris, France, which we're going to be talking a lot about Paris here in the coming weeks, especially. Uh, but he uh, was uh, a man of his time, traveled to other European countries, met different scientists, studied different forms of government. Uh, and this was very, very uh, important for him because he's rubbing elbows with the elite of the day, the elite of the uh, the the elite of the minded men of the day, essentially. Now, while he had left England, he started to become very interested in people. He, uh, this is kind of like when it comes to psychology. He's also important when it comes to uh, the foundation of psychology to an extent where he wanted to study individuals. He wanted to study people and see how they acted and understand why they acted certain ways. Uh, he wanted to specifically see how they wanted to be ruled and I want to understand what was the best form of government for people to be ruled by. He was very interested in finding out that information. Now, the state of nature of man, this is this was very much based upon his experience in England with the uh, execution of King Charles I. He believed that uh, people naturally were evil, uh, that there was nothing good within them, that their state of nature uh, or their human nature itself was selfish, cruel, and evil. That they would do anything to better their position, that uh, through their selfishness, that they would find a way to uh, gain an upper hand, uh, to move into a higher position, to gain more authority, to get what they desire. Uh, he believed that uh, man essentially wanted to seek after his own pleasure and to avoid pain as much as possible. And that was the motivating factor for why they were selfish creatures themselves. Left to themselves, he believed people would act on their evil impulses. That if essentially, if you were to uh, take a group of people and just put them on an island, that without any leadership, without any form of government over them, that they would just naturally implode, that they would tear themselves to pieces, essentially, that they would naturally seek out to uh, better their own selves and to uh, uh, watch out for, for their own selves and not care for one another. He believed they would act on their evil impulses, their selfish desires to protect their own selves, to seek pleasure and to avoid pain. And in order to do that, you're going to have to make sure there's no one there to essentially inflict any pain or take the pleasure from you. Uh, that's his belief. 
So he believed that people should not be trusted to make their own decisions and that people should just be trusted to begin with. Now, he does believe that uh, people do want to have some sense of security and that they want to be able to seek after their own pleasure and that they want to avoid pain. And he believes that the best way to do that is to have a strong government and a strong monarch in place who will rule in an absolute manner that can provide that protection to protect individuals from their own impulses and the impulses of others. That you need a ruler, you need a leader to rule over you. Now, the question comes up though, well, if every single human being has this state of nature of this selfish desire uh, to seek pleasure and to avoid pain, wouldn't that monarch also have those same kind of desires as well? You betcha. Uh, and from his perspective, that would be the case. And so that begs the question, wouldn't he, rather than seeking out the better good of the people, maybe seeking out his own uh, better good himself? That is a, indeed a question that must be asked as well, too, if we're going to follow uh, Hobbes' thinking on the purpose of government in an absolute monarch. But he believes that people cannot make decisions on their own. There needs to be a ruler over them to decide for them. Therefore, nations like people were also selfishly motivated in that you need to have a strong ruler who can guide that nation, guide that kingdom, guide the people to a, a betterment of society, if you will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, here is an uh, image uh, uh, cover of his book Leviathan, or the matter, form, and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil, by Thomas Hobbes of Malmesbury. Malmesbury again is where he was born. They're talking about ecclesiastical and civil. That's dealing with the uh, religious aspect and the uh, government aspect. Ecclesiastical being that religious perspective, civil being that governmental uh, perspective. There, so here he is stating that. You need to have a strong individual, a Leviathan, like that strong creature that could not be tamed by man. Could have, no fish hook, no spear, no nothing could penetrate the scaly body. They could not overpower the strength of the Leviathan. That is, the people themselves should not be able to rebel against this ruler. This ruler should have strict control over the people, over the nation, over the kingdom itself. The purpose of government was to protect people from their own selfishness and evil. It was to restrict it, to suppress it so that it would not come forth. So the purpose of the government is to suppress that evil, suppress that selfishness so it will not come out from one person to the next. He also believed in the rule of a king because he felt a country needed an authority figure to provide direction and leadership. Uh, you have to also remember that Parliament oftentimes struggled with the king and would try to assert its own authority over the king. And uh, as a result of that, we see King Charles I get executed uh, by Parliament. And uh, with that, he has a very strong opinion about Parliament and uh, essentially mob rule in his, in his perspective there, that he believes that all power should be consolidated into one individual can make all the decisions that should not uh, should not be in the hands of a parliament itself, that the king should still be over the parliament itself as well, too. So he believes an authority figure is needed to provide direction and leadership. This then comes into that concept of the divine right of kings, this doctrine, this belief that kings and queens have a God-given right to rule and that rebellion against them is sin that the people should submit themselves to this king in order to receive the protection, protection from themselves, protection from others. And this is where Hobbes will believe this is where true freedom and liberty comes from, where the government itself, the king himself, can protect you from yourself and from others, and that you can live in peace and safety, knowing that your own selfish and evil impulses are being restricted by the laws and rules and regulations that he is putting in place, but not only yours, your selfish impulses, but the impulses of others as well, too, so you can live peaceably with one another. Because people are self-interested, Hobbes believed democracy could never work. That in a democracy, the individuals who are involved in that are too self-interested in what they want, and that it eventually will lead to that uh, kingdom, that nation, to eventually crumble and implode upon its own self because of the selfish desires of other individuals. Now, 
again, in nature, people were cruel, greedy, and selfish. They would fight, they would rob, they would oppress one another. This is man's state of nature. This is how he began. This was his, uh, his natural instinct, if you will. But to escape this, people would enter into a social contract. So think of that island again. If we were to just put a bunch of people on the island itself and lead them to their own uh, doings, one or two things is going to happen. Either they're going to seek out their own selfish impulses and uh, thrash at one another, and eventually uh, you're going to have a degradation, or you're going to see something take place where we're going to see leadership evolve, where we're going to see a social contract uh, take place. That is, they would give up their freedom in return for the safety and order of an organized society. Imagine now, instead of just putting random people on this island, that we put our own selves there. Um, and the question is, in your homeroom, you can start thinking, okay, who would, in order to make sure that we can survive on this island, who might rise up? Um, and begin providing direction, uh, begin organizing, begin giving people tasks and things to do, begin setting in place certain uh, rules like, you know, we need to make sure we're gathering this amount of water each day. Uh, we need to make sure that we are uh, constantly seeking out uh, ways of communication to try and get the attention to people that, that may fly by in planes or boats that may come by. Uh, you may have uh, people begin to... Uh, organize ways of uh, finding food to survive. Uh, and it, it goes on and on from there. They begin to organize themselves in order to survive, where instead of every man for his own self, they begin to work together, enter into a social contract with one another that they're going to get out some of their own freedom that they have in return for safety in order of an organized society. It's the same thing in the classroom. In the classroom, it's not every uh, man or woman for themselves but we have a social contract that we have entered into where I am the authority, uh, the authority in the classroom. I have procedures. I have rules that we follow. There's a certain way we do things. I provide for you the necessary materials that you need, instruction, safety. But at the same time, you still have some freedom in the classroom as well. For instance, you have freedom to speak, uh, to uh, ask questions. You have uh, freedom of movement to a certain extent. So while you may not have absolute freedom, you have a limited freedom, but there is still a, a safety net there. Essentially, there is order. It's organized in the classroom and even online here as well, too, to a certain extent, as much as possible. Uh, so there's this authoritarian, if you will, uh, organization uh, in the classroom itself. But in a sense, I'm trying to get to this idea of the social contract where there is not necessarily on paper, but there is an understanding that uh, in order to receive this uh, protection and safety, you have to give up some of your freedom to certain individuals or to a certain individual in order to have that protection itself. So therefore, Hobbes believed a powerful government with an absolute monarchy was best for society. He believed that this monarch would know what is best for the society itself and that he can make the best decisions to provide that protection and freedom that he believed the people wanted and needed. So again, he had a very pessimistic view on human nature. He believed that life without laws and controls would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So in conclusion here, again, the big question I want us to focus on in this chapter is why did Thomas Hobbes believe in the need for an all-powerful ruler as a leader of the government? This is a question I want you to answer on your chapters three and four big question assignment. And I want you to tell me in detail his belief. What did he believe about the state of nature of man? What did he believe was their natural instinct? And why do they need to have an all-powerful ruler as the leader of the government? This has been a short overview of Thomas Hobbes. I look forward to seeing you in our live uh, check-ins. Please let me know if you have any questions. Have a great day.